from the uh, Portland area, a native Oregonian. And I'm asked about my first experience. My first experience with the phenomena of a Bigfoot happened in 1981. Um, I was elk hunting between Hag Lake, which is Forest Grove area, and uh, Highway 6 towards Tillamook. I was chasing a six by six bull elk, went down into this canyon, was, and it kept on crossing canyons. I was probably three hours in and finally decided I had enough chasing them because I could never get a clear shot. So walking back up the hill, up the hill for all these miles, and I guesstimate it was probably three hours away from my truck on the main line, um, I found this skid road, a real old one. So I started walking up the skid road, which is better than beating the brush. About, about 10 minutes in, I didn't feel right. There was something kind of wrong. I felt really nervous. So I jacked around into my 30 out six and uh, started walking up the hill, up the skid road. And the next thing I know, I stop and I'm got my hair standing up on the back of my neck, hair standing up on my arms, and I can't figure out what's going on. I've been around bear, I've been around cougar, been around all the apex predators, um, and I've never felt like this before. So then I'm take the step and I catch something on my periphery of vision, and there's this black figure in this brush, and I look over and I'm kind of going, what the hell is that? I would catch a leg and an arm that would go, arm and hands that would go past a kneecap, and then part of a torso. And I'm looking at this thing going, that ain't no bear. I'm going, well, if that was a bear, he would have been out of here already. And so I'm walking up, every time I took a step, this thing would take a step, 20, 30 yards tops. I'm nervous as, you could not believe how nervous I am. And I've got a 30 out six, I'm the worst, you know, the biggest, baddest thing out there. I can put anything down. I didn't feel comfortable at all. So <clears throat> for the remainder of the time, every time I would take a step, this thing here to my left, which would have been the, the west, would take a step. And next thing I know, I'm hearing this. <clears throat> Real guttural. And that's not a bear. I don't know what that is. I'm getting out of here. For one hour, it followed me, paralleled my path, all the way up to the mainline road. And when I got to the mainline road, I slung my rifle and ran to my truck and got out of there. I didn't tell anybody, not even my wife, not my buddies, or anybody, this first encounter until 2012. When it finally dawned on me, after my daughters came home from a camping trip, adult daughters, they, and there were seven other kids with them, that they were being harassed by something at night, at midnight, with this whoop calls that were coming into their camp for two hours. The next night was for 20 minutes. And so this was just as the time when Finding Bigfoot was coming online. So my daughters come home, they sit me down, they tell me this, and I'm going, I'm going, uh, so was it a barred owl, you think? No, it's not a barred owl. These girls were raised outdoors and they know all the animals. And I'm going, I got nothing, you know. I'm kind of thinking in the back of my mind, whatever that is, but his sound was not this whoop sounds. So I talked to my boss and said, hey, let's go camping this weekend. So the following weekend, we go up there. And he brought his 14-year-old daughter. We made, you know, we set up camp and all that stuff, roll forward to dinner, you know, had, had dinner. And we walked around the campground. It's about 10, 15, 10 o'clock at night. We walked around the campground, came back. His daughter's tired, goes to bed. One of the things we did is that we, I it took this big stick and banged it up against this, this pole, this tree, 
five times is all I did. And then walk, we walked around back to camp. So his daughter goes to bed. My buddy and I are looking at the stars and the satellites and stuff, just enjoying the camping thing. Next thing we know, 10, 15 p.m., bap, 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 right from where we were, where I made those knocks. So we both stand up. Mark's got this uh, camera that's got an audio record feature. He hits record to hope he could catch those knocks. Next thing we know, from the from the north comes this ooh, real powerful, and we could feel it in our chest. Got that on a recorder. That was the beginning of me trying to find out what this phenomena was. And at that point, I connected the dots, going, "Okay, Bigfoot does exist," because that, that was no barred out. Um, I. Mark and I both independently wrote the BFRO, attached our audio file to our emails, and we were promptly contacted. Now, I'm an archery hunter, so my, that was my season. These guys uh, came out, I was, uh, came out, wanted to meet us on that uh, Saturday. And so the area where, where this all happened, there's motorcycles running around all over the place. There's gunshots going off everywhere. ATVs, everything's going on that day. And here I am in all my archery gear because I just finished hunting uh, probably an hour before they showed up. So they're kind of going, uh-huh, yeah, right, okay. Well, your story is very credible. We're metrologists, and the metrology, metrology is the science of measurement. So, knowing that we were science guys and pretty methodical on our sciences, it was like, well, maybe we should go camp with these guys the following weekend. So we made arrangements. They come out the next weekend. Um, as you probably could tell, I can't whoop do whoop calls to save my life. So... Set up camp, ate dinner. Cindy does these couple, two whoop calls. Had an audio recorder that was sitting 12 feet up in the air. Mine was, uh, b- both of them were. Next thing we know, we got a real good two-minute audio of two of them screaming cross canyon with interludes of what, for lack of a better term, would be song. Sent that around to the BFR, not the BFR world, but other folks, and they're going, that's really cool. That's kind of what pushed me over the edge. And also, because of the, of the what happened, I continued to go out there all the time. Every free moment I had, every weekend, and that started the Tillamook Forest Group. I then became a member of the Olympic Project um, because it was so closely affiliated because I was working with David Ellis and it produced so much audio. So those were audio experiences. I've had a physical experience where I took my daughter's dog, a chocolate lab, and this was in March of 2013. Away from that area, about half a mile, three quarters of a mile away, there was a landing, and I'm, you know, get all camped up. And what I did is I pulled my truck up to where it would overlook my six or be at my six and I put a infrared alarm system up seven feet and it will only go off at seven feet. Brought the speaker portion of it into the tent. I always carry with me, so I have my 45 with me. At um, midnight, my alarm goes off. I'm like going through the ceiling. The dog's sitting up. Her hackles are up. I can see her in the, in the there's like residual light enough where I can see my dog. And something's going around my tent. And it's going, whoosh, whoosh. And you can hear footfall as it's going around my tent. Well, about the third time this thing did this, or going around my tent, the dog jumps in my face, goes down into my, the bottom of my mummy bag. I'm scratched up all the pieces. And it's, you know, and it's down there shaking. Now, had that been a bear or a cougar, she would have done everything she could to go after it. This was not a bear or cougar, as confirmed by the fear of the dog. I'm kind of going, I've never heard that noise in my life. I'm laying there, and it stops behind me. All of a sudden, my tent starts getting pushed in. 
and then contact on the back of my head. Its palm was at the base of my, of my neck. Its thumb right here. The top of the hand right here as it's gently manipulating my head, pushing through my tent. I'm sitting there going, oh, this sucks. I grab my 45 and I'm aiming it right to where I could probably have killed it. And I'm going, nope, not big enough. I put it down. And I'm laying there as it's manipulating my head. Like my head was like a grape to the size, sheer size of this hand. The thumb was ginormous, huge. And of course, like this, and through the tent, no less. Um, so I'm going, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And I was like, I grabbed my keys from my truck, my Dodge Ram, and I burped the alarm system on it, and it backed away. So there's silence for about 30 seconds. And then it starts walking around my tent again, making that noise. Whoosh, whoosh. It's doing that. It stops behind me again. This time I'm going, you know, and it, after about, this was a nine minute, minute encounter. You might want to know why is a nine minute encounter? Because I had it all on audio from the audio that I put up 50 yards away. The interesting fact of this, there was two subjects. The one subject that was messing with me and the other subject that was clicking rocks together near the recorder. I lost that recorder for two years. I didn't know where it was. When I found it, everyone I told that story to with that backed up audio evidence was like, wow. You could even hear me burping the alarm going duh, 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 just like that. So that was a the it stopped one time and then I went I brought out a, a table because this is a landing, so I had my own table. And when I go camping I plan I planned on two days. I'd eat four eggs a day. So I brought I bought brown eggs, took eight with me. Had all my stuff on the table. Uh, and it was misty that night, so I put my medicine in a plastic bag and a paper bag into a box and shoved it underneath the table. Next morning when I came out, my medicine is sitting on top of the table. Uh, well, that's weird. Just kind of shook my head going, oh, first order of business is coffee. So I'm making my coffee. Get it, and I'm drinking my coffee. I'm like, Where in the hell is my Bowie knife? It was right here on my cutting board. There it is, precariously balanced on the end of the table. Perfectly balanced at the end of the table sitting there. And that's not where I left it. So I bring it back and I cut up my stuff for my breakfast and I look over at my cooler. My cooler's half a jar. I open up my cooler, flip it open, my egg carton's open. I have four eggs missing. I brought eight with me. So I'm thinking to myself, well, I must have been too big of a hurry. Whatever. So drinking my coffee, going, what a crappy night this has been. So I walk back behind my tent. And <clears throat> when I did that first burp alarm, I heard this slide into the gravel behind me. What you don't know is that before I did anything that night, I raked down the entire landing so that all the rocks were uniform. There, were, I got a 19-inch impression in the gravel with toe splay right there where my feet were. 19 inches, I measured it and took pictures of it. After that, I was like, okay, I think I'm done for the day. Oh, I'm done with this trip. My dog's freaked out still, so we packed, I packed up and we went home. My first order of business was to go to that egg carton to see how many eggs were left. There were four in there. 
I guess I got, I paid a fee for a cranial massage. I do not know. Here's the deal. In 1981, you know, it's like Bigfoot, it was like, I couldn't even attribute that to Bigfoot. And the other question you have to ask yourself, who would you tell? Moreover, who would offer you an opinion rather than write it off as you're some sort of nutcase? Seeing a hand? Seeing a knee? Seeing a leg? Thigh? Seeing a chest? But not the entire subject? Who do you tell? The fascinating thing that I want to preface about this is that this area where I had this this experience of being touched, if you will, by the as the crow flies, was six miles from that area. As I research, as I began to be more convinced, but especially after that, I was like, okay, he didn't kill me, so that means they're, you know, they're more curious. I felt kind of like a curiosity as my head's being manipulated because he could have broke my neck easy. There's a lot of power in these animals, or whatever they are. So, with that, I went up every weekend. Have I had other experiences? Yes. Have I heard them? Yes. I went from a believer that one night to a knower inside of two years. Um, a knower meaning physical eye contact of a subject in daylight. I've seen them at night too. Um, they're the ones that I've seen have never been aggressive. More curious, I guess would be the lack of a better term. Uh, contact and watching and observing and intimidation if you don't understand the environment that you're in because that's what it's all about is, in, is intimidation. When, when you're not intimidated because you're comfortable within the environment that you're in and this is new, any new person out there would be intimidated, scared for their lives. Well, they pick up on that, in my opinion. If you're relaxed, they're like, oh, I can't rattle that guy. You know, throw all sorts of rocks at him and nothing happens. He sleeps through all of our screaming because I do what's called passive research. And that is I set up <clears throat> seven, eight, nine, ten auto recorders in a one square mile. Let them do the record let them do the research. I've learned you don't have you don't have to go look for them. They they already know you're there. And you're the you're their T V. You're their entertainment. And once I came to that type of research is when more things have happened. Um, so another night, uh, it was a Tuesday night where this was in 2014, February, March, 2014, uh, my, one of my friends and I went up there to deploy audio on a Tuesday night to see what happens when there's no humans around. And I got, just got this new parabolic dish. So we decided to go up this trail where no man goes up at night. It was one of those dark nights where it was so dark that your flashlight would only penetrate about three feet, maybe four. No matter what power you had, that's, it was a thick, heavy, dark night. So we got up the trail probably a couple hundred yards. I already deployed an audio recorder probably 100, 200 yards down below and so about 12 feet up in the air. So, deploying, getting, getting it set up on a tree that's pointing kind of southeast, and we hear this right from the southeast. That was a whistle. It wasn't a bird. I know all my birds. It was not a whistle. This was like a real whistle with pursed lips. The next thing, from the e due east, another whistle. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. So, finish up with the recorder, got everything all going, and we walked back over to the trail, probably 40 yards in the woods, into the woods, and then set up. Walked back to the trail, and all of a sudden, from the east, 
up the trail, I'm hearing this boom, 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 boom. And it's super loud. Um, it's like somebody was walking in the woods with a boom box, but it was just going boom, boom, real loud. And so loud, in fact, and the amplitude was so high that it would reverberate in your chest. Huge amplitude. For those of you who don't know what amplitude is, that's power. So lots of power behind this phenomena. So we shut off our flashlights and try to ascertain what's going on just to see if whatever it is might come in closer. It is coming in closer. I pull my 45 out because it's advancing really quick and the booms are just going boom, boom, just real powerful. I pull my 45 out, flip on my flashlight, said, we got to get out of here, got to get out of here now. Gunner, my buddy, he's like going, what the hell is that? I said, I don't care what it is. We're out of here. Shove him. We start moving on down the trail. He knew there was trouble when I already had my 45 out and I'm rattled because I don't get rattled. So sho uh, shove him. We're moving down the trail a couple hundred yards. There's another trail that comes up from the south, from the uh, due south. Then meets up with this trial, trail that goes east, uh, north. So, or east. So anyway, right as we're crossing that trail, there's another one. So we got this one right behind us, advancing on us the whole time. And another one coming from the, from the uh, south going boom, boom. We were being flanked. It's a military strategy. And basically, we had to get out of that area. So ran, ran, out, ran out of there, you know, got onto the, the road. I burped the alarm on my truck so I could find out where it is. We run over to my truck, hopped in it, and drove off. The cool thing is, all that was caught on video, including, um, not video, audio, I'm sorry, uh, including even some verbiage. Um, call it chatter, whatever you will, but that boom, that low pitch, high, powerful boom, I got it on audio. Really badass. It, it, Last time I looked at that, and it's been a while, but I think the frequency range was uh, below 20 hertz and no higher than, than 100 hertz. Actually, that, that's a good question. So how have these events have ha uh, changed me? Um, I no longer, I have no, absolutely no fear for them whatsoever because I know they don't mean me any harm um, based on my surviving two of the most strangest things that most people could have ever experienced. I have a deep respect for the power that they wield. And I think if people don't respect the environment or the subject and what they're dealing with, that's when they're going to be in trouble. I don't look for these things. Do not. All I do is passive research. I find that they come to me. In the same way that I could segue into my full daylight sighting in 2014. I, I'm a writer. I do a lot of uh, writing, um, introspective thoughts and such. And so I was writing at my big, in my Bigfoot area. I had a fire going and stuff. And I got hungry and I was like, I didn't bring anything. So I just going to head home. So I put out the fire. And <clears throat> that was 12 o'clock p.m. and I'm driving down there. I have a Dodge Ram full size three-quarter ton the two-inch lift. I'm driving down this road about 40 and it's a, it's in March it's, and I looked up at my my temperature thing 71 degrees and all of a sudden I see this uh, down the road well why is there a guy dressed all in black over there why is he wearing a ski mask? It's 71 degrees. Well, and again, I'm going, why? It's just completely jet black. I can see him standing on the side of the road. Big guy. Next thing I know, I'm up there because I'm going 40, right? He steps right out in front of me. It is a big male Sasquatch. He took maybe two steps. I didn't see the, the first one. It could have been three. 
stepped across the road, and his hips were above the hood of my truck. As he stepped across the road with just this amazing agility, he just grabbed this branch and just gave me this look, like, hey, I'm walking here, and then bounced off over to the side into the, into the woods. People didn't realize is that I was actually on a medical leave because I had deep vein thrombosis in my calf. So I slammed on my brakes. And when you do that at 40 miles an hour on gravel, you have a tendency to slide like you are on ice. So after I got control of my truck, I flipped it around, parked it to where I saw that thing came in, left the door wide open, my gun in the truck, the truck running, and I ran over to where I saw that thing go in. I'm going to catch up to that guy. That's what I was thinking. So I found this trail. I'm running beat cheeks for five minutes down this trail. And I realize I'm alone. Truck's running. My 45 is out there in my truck on my seat. And no, that was no guy. That was a Sasquatch. And I belong. And so then I run back to my truck. I get in my truck and I'm sitting there going, I don't feel my calf. I couldn't even walk. I could hardly walk, I was using a, a walking stick. And I ran down that trail like it was nothing. Um, according to a couple sheriffs that interviewed me about this particular thing, it was adrenaline. I didn't feel my calf until I got home. And I could have, from what I did, I, I could have died because I, deep vein thrombosis is something you don't mess with. Um, <clears throat> that was a pivotal moment. I went from a believer to a knower based off of, of eye to eye contact with this thing, its sheer size. And what it did was on purpose. Because I've been going up there for so much. Just like a dog when you, when you come home, it hears your car, I believe it knew it was me. Why it chose to, in broad daylight, 71 degree weather, to step out in front of me at the risk possibly even hurt the injury, I don't know. The fascinating thing about this was, it had this gray spot from here down to its um, uh, scapula area. This gray triangle coming off of it. Um, <clears throat> facial features, the ears were pinned back like this, small lips. Eyes were sunk back, very dark. Head kind of went up like this into a conical shape where the hair came down in kind of a pyramid way over its shoulders. And then that white spot or gray spot over the left. Um, emotion displayed in the look was that of dis like I'm walking here or, or disgust. I didn't have a camera running. I got, as a matter of fact, after two interviews with other people, kind of a debrief, I was able to draw it. And I drew it really well. And I don't draw. But that was burned in my mind forever. I mean, I'll never forget it, especially the details of its glutes, the musculature, its abs, a 10-pack. Like it was in the gym all of its life. Just ripped. And um, the hair as it was coming off the arms, probably about like this. So this is all black with red hues through here. And whenever it moved, it was like this flow. It, the hair would just flow. It was really cool. Um, there was a, I think that probably was the most profound moment I had where it was like, these exist. Now people ask me, what are they? I haven't got a clue. Uh, they've got human features and they've got ape-like features. They act similar to us in a way but more primitive in the way that they protect themselves. I think from my encounters, and I've had five, 
two full daylight ones, three night. They're curious about us in a way. They watch us all the time. I think we present danger to them in some in some respects, and it also could be a natural fear. It's like animals will go look at you for a while, oh, they'll freeze thinking that you can't see them, and then they'll melt, melt off. Or there's something that, you know, it's like, I don't think they like us very much. I think we represent danger to them. But I, I also believe, as many times as I've been around these things, and I've heard them in times where you can't see them, and their proximity to me is that they're a very good judge of a person or, or persons. It's like if I was to go hunting, archery hunting, I'm, I'm out there with the intent to kill, to harvest my game. If you're out there with an intent to look for a Sasquatch or Bigfoot, you'll never find one because they're aware of that. If you go out there with an intent that's a pure motive, and I mean you're just going to kick back and passively let things happen, I think that's when things do happen. And I've, I've proven that out over since 2012. It's just the way it works for me. But um, I think I just really respect them. And I think that they need to be respected. And I don't think very many people understand that because they're always looking for them. Well, guess what? They're, they're not there. They will not be there when you're not looking for them. My last experience happened this year. And I close with this. I was out um, hiking, took my dog with me. This was in the, down the same trail where I had my daylight sighting, full daylight sighting. I was like, well, I'm gonna do some recreating here. I wanna see what's down here because I really never looked it over. I had my dog with me, he's a border collie. He's been around Bigfoot since he was a puppy. He's been to their feet. Uh, they whistle at him, he would just disappear in the night, go right to him, you could see his white tail going like this. I thought it was a losing the first time he did this, but apparently they like him. I don't know why. <clears throat> so we're walking down this trail, and I brought my Native American flute with me. So what I was going to do was play some flute, and I heard, I heard the water. I was like, oh, I'll go over here. So I went off trail about 20, about, uh, about 100 yards off trail and I found this creek. So I walked across the creek and I'm noticing, where's Cody? He would not walk across the creek, not at all. So I called him, called him and called him and called him. And he finally came across the creek, but by the time he was coming up to me, he was shaking. He's never done that in his entire life. So I got him to lay down at my feet and I played my flute for about an hour. And it's like, oh, I just stood up, kind of looking around, going, oh, there's a, again, whenever I'm out in the woods, I'm hunting too. So I'm looking for new spots. It's like, oh, there's a metal thing over there. I think maybe I'll go over there and see what's going on. So about 50 yards, I'm no Cody. Now, Cody's usually leading the way. So I go back, Cody's 30 yards from where I left him, and he's, he's laying down behind a bunch of ferns, like this. I was like, oh, that's not good. So then I was like, what the heck? So I started looking around, I grabbed my phone, and I videoed the area. And then I swept back to where Cody is, which is not like him, scared. And I'm kind of going, I, I said to, while I was doing the video, I'm gonna videotape this area and I'm gonna to listen to my dog because he, he's, there's something he doesn't like here. And so we vacated the area, left, and when I, when I got home and I reviewed the video and found within maybe 30, 40 yards from me, a structure-like cave thing that was pitch black right behind me. I sent that to a few other people, they're going, that, again, if it was Bear or Cougar, Cody would not have been, you know, because he's very fast and very aggressive and would not have done anything. 
but there was a cage-like structure right over there. And it dawned on me, and I'm gonna go back up there later with more help and set up a bunch of passive equipment, but that could have very well been a dwelling. I can't tell you that, but based on my experiences with proximity to this area and discovering that, I'm kind of thinking that needs further investigation. And it's basically based on an animal, a dog, that's got the most primitive uh, survival instincts to not press any further. It was like he walked right into a wall, stopped. I don't have that sense. I got better senses than most people. So I have to rely on him tell me what's going on. And that's what it was like, okay. And a lot of, I've got a lot of audio that could back up. I got, I even have them even talking. And I've sent the, some of my audio to the Salish uh, Indian Reservation. And some of the elders say that it, it sounds like ancient Salish. Now, most of it's my stuff is not like Ron Moorhead's, where Ron's just going, Ron's has got all this apes just going nuts. Mine are like small sentences. Like one, I can't remember exactly the name, but it's one female would go, Elisa, where are you? Kind of like that. Another one would be a big male, like, whoop, come sit. Well, come sit in a different, in, in a Salish language has, a, I forget the meaning, but it's like, you know, it's pretty cool. But whoop, come sit. You know, or, or uh, there was another one where it said, and again, this is our minds interpolating what they're saying through an audio recorder that it does nothing but interpolate. I mean, you can hear voices and stuff like this, but to us in our, in our ears, interpolating what, one was like, whoop, come shoot me. But that's not really what they said, it was something else. And uh, they, you know, just gibberish, I call it gibberish, or so I did them in such close proximity that they sound like uh, this grumbly horse thing. I've got recordings of them doing <laughs> chest slaps. I've got recordings of them going, ooh, you know, like that. Just some real cool stuff. Real crystal clear. I mean, if I was to put that onto the, the Patterson film and the, you can think about it this way. I was from my driver's seat to the hood of my truck away from it. Four feet. I got a pretty good look. When our eyes met, that was from the driver's seat to the passenger side. Four feet. I got a good look at it. Yeah, it's basically what I saw was intelligence and also there was a subliminal message. It, it, you know, think about it. It did it on purpose. It didn't have to step out on the road. It did not. It could have stepped back and hid behind the bushes that were there, that it was standing next to. It chose at that moment to step out in front of me. And it chose at that moment to lock eyes with me. It didn't have to. It could have just done what most of them did. Bail, go, exit stage left. These were intelligent choices, which tells me they're intelligent, of course. Do they have emotions? Yes, they have emotions. They have the same type of emotions that we have. I know that for a fact. It was like he almost hit me, you idiot. <laughs> I was walking here. You know, it was kind of a, yeah, it wasn't anger. It was more of a disgusted thing. You could have hurt me, you idiot. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of the way it was. Thing is, is that uh, we humans are not patient. Because we're, especially here in America, so we want everything now, society. Well, part of the ex thing that people don't realize is we've lost our connection to the wilderness. It's a very important connection. Being in an artificial environment that we live in today, we've left behind what is that natural thing that we're most balanced with, and that is this environment here. There's no 60 hertz, no 60 hertz signal disrupting our body rhythms. We're getting the natural rhythms 
from the environment that we came out of. I think that a lot of people have fear, you know, because it's the things in the dark, the boogeyman. You know, you got to be able to conquer your own fears and be, be good with spending your time in an environment. Oh, I got allergies. Well, if you spend enough time in the environment, your allergies dissipate. There's also a healing factor in the woods. And I'm not talking about a metaphysical type of thing. I'm talking about the natural aromatic uh, flows that come from the plants around that can literally boost your immune system. There's natural foods out in the woods. People don't know that. Mountain people don't know that. Mushrooms, uh, you know, herbs, all sorts of things. And these are learned traits, natural things. But for me, every free moment I have is in the woods. I'm not bigfooting. That's a bonus. That's icing on the cake. But just to, to uh, feel the natural world, to, to have balance. And I think that's where most of the people do not have is that balance anymore because they lost, they lost that feel or that drive or what's natural to be in the natural environment. And you know what? If you do this stuff or what I do, you'll find peace and balance, even though you're not looking for it.